We access these people through um, uh, the language that we use for contact. We often deal with people who have undergone some attrition. I, like if you think about the data that were presented in Chukchi, there are no very fluent Chukchi speakers these days. So there is inevitable attrition. And then finally, there are educational level differences. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples um, of the letter. So this is a very simple picture matching experiment. You see two pictures and you hear the girl is following the woman. Which picture do we need? The right or the left? probably very easy to, to decide that this is the right picture. The girl is following the woman. This is the woman is following the girl. So it, an extremely simple technique. It's very useful because it can be applied to people who don't read, whose languages don't have literacy. But I wanna show you some accuracy on picture matching in Mayan languages. So uh, this is just accuracy in percentages. And the next slide, I'm gonna show you reaction time. So this is the study by Yasunaga and company where they looked at uh, bilingual speakers of Kapchikel who were all Spanish fluent. They were all university students and they had no problem uh, matching the pictures for correct word order in Kapchikel, it's above 90%. And then what we did, we ran a bunch of experiments on relative clauses where we again use picture matching and we use two languages, Kakchikil and Kanghobal. And what you want to look at is the solid bars and the um, strike through bars. So these people are bilingual in Spanish and a Mayan language. They went to school in Spanish. They're very used to taking the test. These people are monolingual Kakchikil and Kanghobal speakers. And you can see that their accuracy in picture matching is significantly lower than the accuracy on the part of those people who speak Spanish and have had uh, an educational advantage. So it's just an illustration that when we're trying to do some kind of experimental work, we have to be prepared for a lot of noise giving educational differences. These are reaction times. So here I'm just showing you the relative clauses because the Japanese team did not do reaction times. And you can see that my Kakchikel and Kanghobal bilinguals who speak Spanish they're pretty fast. They're about 1500 milliseconds for choosing the right picture. You can see that uh, the monolingual mind speakers are almost twice as slow because it's very hard for them, although it's in their own language. Again, the educational difference comes in. They clearly understand what these sentences mean, but we see the experimental indication that their um, educational level comes in and plays a significant role in the result. So I've talked about graded judgments. I talked about the novelty basis. I wanna very briefly talk about replicability and the crisis of replicability. Uh, there is always need to access the original data for independent analysis. Probably the most famous example is Pierre Hong, uh, where there's Dan Everett who says that this language does not have embeddings and doesn't have any theory of mind uh, and the world. And so people have been looking at their hunt texts collected by Everett and trying to reanalyze them. So you may agree or not agree with him, but at least we can uh, use his data to judge the experiment. And then uh, we have to create new data, which can then ostensibly be analyzed for confirmation or uh, dis disproval of previous results. So when we look at data, there are multiple things that can go wrong, normal human error, something that's very common in field linguistics, too small sample, very few data points, very few speakers, uh, different conditions of research. If you think about the bilinguals and monolinguals I showed you from Mayan, you can think of that. Uh, often it's publication bias by journals because a lot of journals will not take a paper if it's just a description. You have to have a discovery and not everything has to be a discovery. And then probably the most important thing is that is the researcher's bias because we often want to support our favorite hypothesis rather than try to falsify it. And that forces us to skip some links in the research cycle. Takes me to this very uh, famous quote by Richard Feynman, where he says, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And so when you have this, um, so a circle where you know you collect data, you analyze it, you interpret it, you publish more collected, you have hypotheses, you design study, and this goes in the circle. We often skip uh, certain steps, and the experiment appeal of experimental syntax in that 
is in that it allows us to um, hold the hypothesis constant uh, and then increase our sample size, rely on some existing designs or rely on established collection techniques. And so that's again, something that experimental syntax allows us to do in a fairly rigorous way. So um, now that I've shown you why we need to talk about that, I wanna look at three uh, as facets of how we could build better models. And I'm actually gonna start with an example where an experiment is totally not necessary. It would be a waste of time. Uh, then we're gonna look at one example I've prepared two, but I won't have time to go both. Um, one example where the experiments can actually help theory and then where theory can help experiments. So uh, uh, again, one is no experiments needed, experiments helping theory, theory helping experiments. So uh, here's an example where experiments are, may not be called for. So there is this, um, in generative syntax, there is this model of um, case licensing, which is called case by agree. Uh, and the idea is that there's a set of functional heads in the uh, structure. And these uh, functional heads, which don't have lexical content, they license different cases. And each case licensing is tied to agreement. So that means that there is a syntactic head which probes for a particular goal in its command domain. And this head wants to get value from that goal so that its own unvalued features would become valued. So case is one of those feature valuation mechanisms together with agreement. And so the idea is that the nominative case is always assigned under agree with the finite T head tense. Genitive is assigned under agree with determiner head. Accusative is assigned under agree with little V or voice head. So these are, that's a very simple model. And even if you're not to uh, involve with generative grammar, the idea is that case and agreement are very tightly related. They basically form a single process. So this uh, work by Paulina Plaschak on Hilmari, where she shows that participial clauses in Hilmari can have subject either in the nominative or in the genitive. An agreement on the participial predicate is actually possible regardless of the case borne by the subject. So you have Two examples here, the tree cut by you. Uh, here you have you in the genitive case. In the second example, you have you in the nominative case. But in both cases, agreement is possible. So you can have agreement with second singular and both, both segments mean the tree cut by you. So that indicates that the agreement is separate from case. Uh, we have the same agreement pattern on the same head in two, but we have two different case forms of the subject. And that immediately shows that case cannot be assigned under agree. So notice we didn't need to run an experiment. She went to the field sheet, interviewed a bunch of speakers, and we have this result which says your model is not right. You have falsified the case by agree model. So the next step is, okay, if this model doesn't work, how is case assigned? And there is an alternative so-called configurational case model. I'm not gonna go over that, but the important thing is that this model is not tenable. And then we also need to look for other languages which could replicate the Hilmari pattern of dissociating case and agree. So it's a simple illustration showing that some models can be tested without uh, very complicated experimental machinery. The next example I would like to show you has to do with experiments at the service of theory. As I said, I have two examples, that trace effect and agreement and concord. I will go over that trace effect. And if there are questions about agreement and concord, I'll be happy to show it in the question period. So the that trace effect is um, well known from English. And the idea is that some languages ban extraction from the subject position in a subordinate clause if the complementizer is a verb. I actually chose some examples from Russian because most people in the audience speak Russian. And um, I put percentages here because this is very colloquial, uh, but I hope that everybody will agree that A through C are better than D. Кого ты думаешь, Маша позовет? Кто ты думаешь, позовет Машу? Кого ты думаешь, что Маша позовет? Кто ты думаешь, что позовет Машу? So uh, for most Russian speakers, 
although I'm much older than most speakers here, but hopefully for your generation as well. The first three are okay. That's how people speak. That's not how Zemska wrote and Ruska is governed age, but that's 50 years ago. But D is still out, and that's because we're trying to extract from the subject position over the complementizer that. So here's the that trace effect in English. Who do you think that Sue met? Fine. Who do you think uh, Sue met without that? Also fine. Who do you think that met Sue? Completely out. We're trying to extract from the subject position over that. Who do you think that met, met Sue? Fine. So um, again, we have this ban uh, on extraction from subject position in subordinate clauses over an overt complementizer. So English has it, Russian has it, French and Wolof have it. Some languages like Spanish, for example, do not require uh, that trace effect. So in Spanish, you can actually extract the subject over the obligatory que. So you can have a quien crees conoce a Susana, a quien crees conoce a Susana without que, that's bad. And the crucial one is C, quien crees que conoce a Susana, where we extract the subject over que and it's fine. So there's been a lot of intensive research and uh, the facts are known, but the story is basically a mystery. And so uh, when people look at the difference between let's say English and Spanish, the idea is that the variation can be traced to different feature specifications on uh, relevant functional heads. And the relevant functional heads are either complementizer C or the finiteness head T. And so people sometimes say, well, the difference between English and Spanish is in the nature of the complementizer, the difference between that and K. And the Russian sto will be like the English that. Some other people say that the difference is in the available subject position. So the nature of the finiteness head T and the nature of the so-called EPP. Um, and so there are essentially four main theories of that trace effect. One is anti-locality. Another is criterial freezing. The third one is prosodic alignment. And this one is T2C raising. Don't panic. I'm going to show you what they all are. So for now, it's just a bunch of words, but I'm going to explain um, how they work. So anti-locality means that you cannot move from specifier of TP to specifier of CP because it's too short. It's too short a movement. That's why it's called anti-locality. That's why the extraction from the subject position should be universally barred. How is Spanish different? Spanish does not have the EPP. It doesn't have the obligatory preverbal subject. So you can move from the postverbal position and that movement is not too short. So you're not violating anti-locality. English and Russian have anti-locality and as a result, you have uh, that trace effect. The second analysis is criteria freezing. And the idea is that positions, uh, some positions have so-called interpretive properties. For example, subjects are, because subjects are kind of like topics. And so those positions are frozen. So the nature is, the story is not about the complementizer. It's about the finiteness head and about this nature of subjects. And again, Spanish is different from English because there is a null explicit which can fill the subject position. That one does not have any interpretive properties, so we can extract. The third story is uh, so-called prosodic alignment, which has been very popular lately. And that is that there is a certain match between syntax and prosody. And if you have an empty uh, specifier of TP, if you extract from that, it cannot align with the left edge of the international phrase, or it cannot phrase with the C together. And so you have a failure in the matching of prosody and syntax. And therefore we expect that uh, extraction from the specifier of TP from subject should be universally barred. Now in Spanish, as in some other Romance languages, the verb moves to T. And that means that there is a higher head in an international phrase. And so you're not violating the prosodic alignment. And then finally, there is the so-called T to C analysis, Pizetsky and Torego, where uh, T is raised to C. And when it's raised, it surfaces as the English that. And extracting a subject is more economical and that blocks the T raising. And that's why you get the, the that trace effect. In Spanish, K is considered a true complementizer and not an instance of T in C. And that's why, again, Spanish is different. 
So here at the four analyses, and so the question is, can we use experimental syntax to show which of those analyses is better? And there is a very, very nice paper which just came out uh, by Hoot and Eber uh, on using the code switching data to consider those four analyses. So code switching is, of course, using two or more languages in a single sentence. And we know that code switching is rule governed like all natural languages. Phenomena. So if you have children, if you have, sorry, Spanish and English, you can say something like the children and then continue in Spanish, hug the platypus, but you cannot have a pronoun and then hug the platypus. So the pronoun has to be also in Spanish, it has to be licensed in a certain way. And so code switchers are not free. And so what uh, Hood and Ebert did in their study, they took those four theories, which I showed you, and they made predictions for code switching. So if this is anti-locality, uh, remember that anti-locality says don't move from too short of a distance. So the idea was that you can only extract from the post-verbal position in code switching. And so whatever determines the subject position will determine extraction under code switching. Okay? If we have criterial freezing, we cannot have a full subject in the pre-verbal subject position. So whatever determines the availability of null subject will determine the availability of um, extraction over a complementizer and code switching. So if you uh, assume prosodic alignment, what you need to, is to make sure that your verb moves to a higher head and that would determine the code switching behavior. And finally, if it's the difference between T and C, uh, the language in which the complementizer is used will determine the code switching behavior. So if you're, you're code switching and the complementizer is that in English, you're not going to have subject extraction. If the complementizer is K is in Spanish, you're going to have a subject extraction. So they had this very uh, simple acceptability judgment test. They had uh, complementizers that and K. They had tense either in English or in Spanish, and then they can compare the extraction of object and subject. So these are some of the examples. This will probably go too fast, but the crucial thing is, uh, what did the teachers assume that the child read before the test? Okay, uh, and then who did the teachers assume that read something before the test? So you have object and subject extraction. And so what you expect is that the nature of that and K will probably play a role, and the nature of the language after the extraction will play a role. Uh, I'm happy to send this paper and uh, refer you to, to it. It's a very, very nice paper. But so the predictions are like in factorial design are that if you're just looking at subject versus object, so object should be fine, subject should be bad, and then uh, if the tense is in Spanish, it should be worse. If the tense is in English, it should be better. So let's see what happens. What happens is that they did not find any tense effect. They did not find any effect of the complementizer. And so it immediately shows that, um, and this is the second result. This is the prediction where we expect that for the uh, Spanish, we're not going to get much of a difference because K is a real C and that is a T to C and we're going to have that, that effect and this is what you get. So what they found was that um, the extraction over K was still quite bad when you had the subject extraction. So in a nutshell, what they found was that extraction of subjects over that is always bad. And that means that the Spanish tense alone did not help with subject extraction, contrary to one of the analysis. Uh, and the extraction over K found was that subject extraction was only acceptable in one case. And that means that Spanish complementizers alone does not license subject extraction. Even though you use K, which is a genuine complementizer, the, the extractions are still bad. So if we go back to the four theories, anti-locality, criterial freezing, prosodic alignment, and T2C, we can start with this one. Remember that uh, the use of K alone did not help with that trace effect. So this theory is out. Uh, the use of T alone did not help with that trace effect. So this theory is also out. 
And then we have two theories which are actually supported by experimental work because C and T together permit trustworthy subjects and C and T together permit null subjects. So we end up with uh, eliminating two out of four accounts. We don't have a story which tells us how to separate anti-locality from criterial freezing, but that's the next step. And now we have to decide whether we want to have more experimental work or we can just use these results and start thinking about possible theoretical implications. But we've successfully ruled out at least two analysis out of four. So the next one I'm gonna skip because this is agreement versus Concord. I will be very happy to show you that, but um, now I wanna to move to uh, my next point and that is how theory can actually be at uh, of use to experimental work. And I wanna remind you of that picture where I had people looking at the human head, not quite knowing what they do. So here we start with a famous observation and that is that subject and object and relative clauses are different in processing. So the famous example, the pair of examples is the reporter who attacked the Senator admitted the error. In English, you can also say the reporter that attacked the Senator admitted the error. Crucially, the gap in the relative clause, which is in brackets, corresponds to the subject. The object relative clause is when the gap in the relative clause corresponds to the object. The reporter who the Senator attacked admitted the error or the reporter that the Senator attacked admitted the error. It's really important to look at those gaps because what matters is what this head now, <clears throat> excuse me, was doing inside the relative clause. So this is a subject relative. The gap corresponds to the subject in the relative clause. This is the object relative. The gap corresponds to the object of the relative clause. So far so good? Okay. Um, so what we know from a lot of studies is that object relative clauses are harder to process than subject relative clauses. And harder to process has been measured in a number of ways. Less accuracy on comprehension questions, slower reaction times, and neuroimaging differences. So in all these measures, this type of example, the reporter who attacked the senator where the gap is in the subject position is easier than the reporter who the senator attacked where the gap is in the object position. So that has been replicated uh, and that has been found in a bunch of languages. People started looking at English, then people started looking at uh, uh, languages with different word orders and it was replicated as well. It was also replicated in accusative and ergative languages. So here's Korean where the uh, head noun follows the relative clause and you can see that the reading time at the head noun and spillover for subject relatives, the reporter who attacked the senator is much less than the reading for the reporter who the senator attacked. So you see a very clear indication that the word order does not play much of a role. Um, ergative languages, so in ergative languages, the objects and intransitive subjects are in the same case, transitive subjects are in a different case. In nominative languages, objects are in one case and all subjects are in a different case. And what we find is that, again, uh, subject relative clauses are actually easier to process if uh, we're comparing them to object relative clauses. So this is from two studies, our own study and uh, Steve Foley, where again, if you look at the red line, you can see the Georgian readers, when they read the object relative clause, the reporter who the senator attacked, take longer than when they read the subject relative clause, the reporter who attacked the senator. And so the question is, okay, we've seen all these results. People have done a ton of work on those relative clauses because every language has them. It's fairly easy to test. And so we see this universal tendency, object relative clauses are more difficult. We have the generalization, we don't know why. And the question is, why should we care about the answer? And I think the answer is that the contrast can serve as key data for understanding of human parsing, which can be shaped by general memory architecture, linguistic structure, or interpretive connections between language units. So if you look at these three bullets, the middle one, linguistic structure, that's about syntax. 
The next one, interpretive connections between language units. That's interpretation, that's um, semantics or something like that. And then finally, the first one, general memory architecture, is our general cognitive abilities, which do not have much to do with syntax. And so if we decide between those three, we could actually tell if something we're looking at is syntactic in nature or not. And so the right explanation may still tell us something important about the parser and the interpretive system, or maybe just the syntax. So there have been four different explanations why object relative flows are more difficult. One is frequency. The next one is difference in thematic roles. Next one is uh, the difference in structure. And then finally, integration and parsing, which is gonna go under the rubric of general memory constraints. So uh, when people started noticing that relative flows are more difficult, the first explanation was subject relative flows are more frequent, so comprehenders predict them. And uh, it's very easy to show that this is not the case. So if you look at English, for example, uh, English has a ton of different corpora, and if we just compare relative clauses based on transitives, like at the senator at that, the reporter and so on, uh, you get about 31% subject relative clause and 37.5% object relative clause. And you have a similar distribution in other languages. So the frequency explanation is not gonna work. The next one is uh, the explanation in terms of thematic role effects. And the idea here is that the object is more tightly connected to the verb than the subject. The subject kind of exists on its own, whereas the object is the role of the object, the role of the theme or patient is very much defined by the verb that it associates with. And so there is a greater memory cost for assigning the more tightly associated thematic role to the verb. And so all factors being equal, Relative clauses based on external arguments should be processed faster or easier because the external argument does not depend on the verb for its thematic role. If that's the case, we can predict that uh, the external role such as goal or recipient should be processed faster the way subjects are because it's also external. So if you take verbs like uh, greet, um, introduce, uh, present, offer, they have a, an external argument. And so you present someone to someone, you introduce someone to someone. And so the dative argument should be processed faster. So we ran the study in Korean where we compared uh, subject relative clauses, the teacher who greeted the headmaster together with the parents in the morning. Uh, then we had the object, the headmaster whom the teacher saluted together with parents in the morning. And then finally the parents to whom the headmaster introduced the teacher in the morning. So the expectation is that this relative clause, the one in the bottom of the table, will be processed as fast as the subject relative clause or definitely faster than the object relative clause. And so what you see is that there is no, such prediction is not borne out, okay? So what you have is subject relative clauses are processed very fast. Object relative clauses are processed slower. Indirect object or goal relative clauses are as slow or even slower than the object. And so that means that thematic role explanation is suspect. So we cannot really confirm that all other factors be equal relative clauses based on external arguments should be processed faster. So we're left with two other explanations. One is structural differences and the other is memory effect for retrieval and integration. The structural difference is the idea that you have to go through more nodes when you connect the head noun with the subject gap than when you connect the head noun with the object gap. So it's further away. And the idea is that representations with greater structural distance between dependent elements are generally dispreferred. So I'm showing you that here you have to go through two nodes you have a certain structural distance. Here you go through three nodes, you have more structural distance. There are different ways of counting that, but I hope that the general principle is clear. So if that's the case, then we shouldn't expect the same effect in what's called correlatives. And I'm gonna present some examples of correlatives in Russian from uh, Mitrenina's work. So, these are examples of correlatives where they, there is no head noun outside and you have just a full uh, clause which is somehow associated with the matrix clause. So here I have 
такая машина им подойдет, они не have the correlate hope такую. Какую машину он заметит, такую начинает хвалить. And so the relation between the noun in the correlative CP and some kind of a demonstrative like такую in Russian is not synthetic. It's, a, it's an anaphoric relationship. And so this anaphoric relationship would not necessarily lead us to structural effects. So Georgian has correlatives, and in Steve Foley's work, he looks at uh, Georgian correlatives with the mm, complementizer ROM, which is like что or that. And um, just sort of if you eyeball this structure, what I would like to call your attention to is that the darker um, points are lower, because the darker points are subject correlatives, the lighter ones are object correlatives. So what we see is that object correlatives are again slower than subject correlatives. So what we see is the same contrast between subject and object correlatives as we saw between subject and object relative plots. And that means that the structural distance may only be implicated in a very indirect mediated way. So that leaves us essentially with the last explanation, which has nothing to do with syntax, and that is the flow and order of information given the overall structure. So you have more material held in working memory in object relative clauses. You have more retrieval interference in object relative clauses. And what you have essentially is greater memory cost. And because you have a greater memory cost, object relatives are harder. So when your brain processes things, what it cares about is only how long you have to carry that information, where can you dump it, where can you get rid of that? That's essentially the constraint on memory. The sooner you get something out of your working memory, the better. And what we now can look for is evidence for working memory effects in relative clauses. And if we now look at neuroimaging data, we actually find a consistent effect which is observed across different languages in electrophysiological studies, always in object relative clauses. So this effect is called left anterior negativity. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain how ERPs work. So I'll just have to call your attention to the chart and say that when we compare uh, relative clauses with subject gaps and relative clauses with the object gap, we always find so-called left anterior negativity in uh, the electrical response to object relative clauses. We find it in English. We find it in Korean, exactly the same. The charts are a little different. So here's the Korean results. So we got the same left anterior negativity. And I'm very proud because we found it in Georgia. It was, took a lot of work to take this portable machine, which I showed you on one of the slides to Tbilisi. We had to run the experiments in the heat of Tbilisi summer without air conditioning. You cannot have a fan running when you run the experiment. We still got probably the biggest, fattest land I've ever seen in my life. So I'm very happy. So you have this replication um, over and over again. The left anterior negativity is back. And so what we see is the neural response, which is that object relative clauses consistently evoke anterior negativity or just left anterior negativity in event-related brain potentials. And so the LAN would be very tempting to interpret this LAN as a sign of thematic integration or as a sign of some syntactic difference. But we've already seen that those explanations do not work. And so if we look at LAN or anterior negativity and connect them to object relative clauses, what we can say is anterior negativity essentially means that you're integrating some material which was collected at the distance and you don't want to carry it in your working memory. And what we do see is that there are a lot of instances of anterior negativity in other cases, not just in object relative clauses, but also in English WH questions in German WH questions, in Japanese, when you scramble the object, in English passives, and in garden past sentences. This, these examples do not have a common syntactic or even semantic foundation, but they all care, carry the same kind of association between keeping something in your working memory and integrating the material that came before. So this is again, the LAN I showed you. Um, here is the land in WH questions. If you compare, do you wonder if they caught it by accident? And who, do you wonder who they caught at it by accident? 
you're going to get a land here because you have a gap. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So uh, that just tells us that <clears throat> anterior negativity indexes uh, the uh, working memory, retrieving the less accessible material from working memory and integrating it with the current material. So we ended up with the uh, with rejecting two explanations based on primary data. And then as we look at the ERP data, we can actually say that the structural difference between relative clauses is only of mediated effect and does not play the primary role. And so we interpret this neural signature as a sign of retrieval and integration of material. Okay. So I only have two slides. I know I'm a little out of time. So what I wanted to sort of confirm is that there is no conceptual divide between theoretical and experimental syntax. They use different tools, they use different vocabularies, but the fundamental questions are the same. And hopefully if my relative clause illustration um, came through, we can say that not all the effects that we observe are about syntax, nor do they have to be. And understanding this theory of syntactic theory may actually be helpful in getting rid of this idea that it's all about structure. So this is an illusion and we have to use experimental data to take this illusion out of our picture. And finally, um, I hope that I've shown that we don't always have to run experiments. So my motto is don't run experiments unless you absolutely have to and have a set of clear predictions. And don't write experiments in the field unless you've done that kind of work with more familiar languages. So thank you very much. Sorry, I went over time, but we have about 10 minutes for questions. Asha, thank you very much. That was very exciting. And I, I already, well, actually, I, there are a lot of texts in the chat, uh, but I think not everything qualifies as a question. I think Alexey Vignar was first. Okay. Asha, please. And you can, um, if you like to ask questions in Russian. Yes, I, I, I had, I, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. I had like several, but uh, about, I think my main question was about uh, frequencies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and uh, how to test whether they're true or not. And actually uh, it was more about the experiment design. So maybe uh, the frequency explanation cannot be tested in such straightforward manner. So we just measure which is more frequent or not, but maybe whether we test uh, how repetition of something else uh, affects the, uh, affects the, um, yeah, the reaction time or something like, like this. So uh, yeah, uh, do there, uh, because I'm like, I don't know nothing about <laughs> experimental syntax. So do uh, like some theoretic uh, experimental syntaxes actually test uh, the, mechanisms are the theorists uh, assume ascribe to frequency like not the frequency itself but how it works yeah so people um i think the clearest example is passes because passes are generally very infrequent and so what people would do like if you compare actives and passives um you would expect that there would be a much more delayed response to passives and uh, people still test that, but um, often when you interpret the results, the statistics come in. So frequency can be just used as a uh, factor when you do your statistics in the results. So it's it's more of a tool. It's just, you know, in the team where people do experimental syntax, you always have to have a good statistician and they will just say, okay, well, we had, I don't know, 20 stimuli, 10 actives, 10 passives but passives in natural language are like 20 times rarer, let's put it in the stats. So uh, just one illustration. Um, in terms of relative clauses, the idea is that, okay, let's look at what people produce. Uh, another thing, which I think maybe you had in mind is that um, most ex experimental work tests ambiguous relative clauses. So the senator attacked the reporter, the cat chased the dog, when we talk in real life, we normally say, you know, the apple that I ate, and it's very unlikely the apple is going to eat me. 
And so people who don't like the explanation um, that, you know, theory spreaders say, well, but you don't use the senator who attacked the reporter in everyday life. You mostly use the apple that I ate. And so people have actually gone to corpora and have tried to just look for the frequency of those ambiguous ones or to look, um, people use so-called closed tests. So let's say if you wanna test if something is frequent or not, you give people a be the beginning of a sentence and ask them to continue that and see what they come up with. So there are all kinds of tricks. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't wanna say, you know, I should put your worries to rest completely, but there are a lot of possible ways to circumvent this issue. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Peter, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Masha. This was really very exciting and I, I've learned a lot. Thank but you. Uh, I, well, I have a silly and naive question which I put in the chat. Uh, the study on code switching that you reported is mm -hmm. really very interesting, but my question is, I'm wondering whether mm -hmm. it's at all possible to elicit acceptability judgments with code switching and this sort of uh, this sort of uh, speech varieties yeah. because um, well uh, I have always thought that that code switching is something that people makes do spontaneously but would never accept if presented, mm -hmm. but uh, perhaps I'm simply wrong. Well, I don't know if you're wrong, but um, there seem to be very robust judgments. <clears throat> and what they did, of course, they had a lot of examples and they compared speakers, not only across each other, but to each other. And so again, uh, part of the uh, trick is that they had um, so-called Z-scores where let's say you give judgments on a scale from one to five, and let's say you score everything very generously. And then I score very, very judiciously. And what they do is they just run additional statistics to average over that. So the results are pretty robust. You still have a contrast. Um, and the contrast seems to be consistent across speakers. So, uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be some individual variation, but this individual variation is not always free for all. So um, I th then that study, they, did, they also ran reaction times. I just don't remember what they did, but I think the reaction times are also uh, going in the same direction. Um, after the questions, I'll put that study in the chat or I can send it to Dima and people can look for themselves, but yeah. I hope I can put some of your worries to rest. And then I also see your comment that Georgian is not a prototypical ergative language. I agree completely, but it's probably the only ergative language, um, or partially ergative language, where you have uh, you can collect 45 people who can read and who can come to the lab and allow the electrodes to be on their head. Uh, which is what you need for the um, ERP study. So in that sense, we're very limited. So there's been some ERP work on Basque, on Hindi, and on Georgian. They all come with a lot of strings attached, but I think it would be much harder to run it on a language where people don't read or they read very slowly. I ran a study on Archie, oh, sorry, on Avar. Um, and even Avar, although it's a large language and they have the writing system, they have some literature, my speakers were reading about three times slower than your average Russian reader does. So, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. puts on some limitations. But yeah, that's a that's a totally legitimate comment. Thank you. Okay, please, Artem. Да, спасибо. Я все-таки предпочту по-русски. Там, да, там были примеры. Ну, сейчас уже презентации нет. Ну, короче, были примеры. Три примера с решеткой и последний пример со звездочкой. Но, понимаете, я сказал бы так, что, конечно, они все не очень литературные. Да? Абсолютно. Вообще говоря, пример четвертого типа я встречал вот, угу. в разговорных текстах. Поэтому э, всегда вопрос, как мы отделяем, то есть мы же не по статистике это выводим, да? то есть мы угу. на основании каких-то ощущений, я, я не знаю, вот мне, мне очень сложно провести вот эту границу, как это угу. обосновать. А вы знаете, совершенно верно, мы можем, если у нас есть вот эти graded judgments, то 
иногда делают следующее. Иногда говорят, что да, вот эти три примера с решеткой, они все не идеальны, но все-таки они лучше, чем пример со звездочкой. И там, скажем, из десяти человек один человек примет пример со звездочкой, а восемь человек примет пример с решеткой. И вот это вот такой способ подхода к grade adjustment. Дальше включается статистика, действительно, которая усредняет ощущение носителя. Что касается литературного языка, то это вообще совершенно отдельная тема, потому что, ну, представьте себе какого-нибудь там дедушку в Архангельской области, который, может быть, четыре класса в школе учился. У него же тоже есть какие-то ощущения про язык. Они будут не такие, как у нас с вами, потому что мы учились в школе и университете. И вот дальше вопрос... Какие из этих ощущений связаны с нашей такой ментальной репрезентацией языка, а какие связаны с образованием? Вот здесь грань провести очень трудно. Поэтому вот я хотела показать эти результаты про языки Майя, где очень видно, что те люди, которые в школу ходили, реагируют одним образом, а те люди, которые в школу не ходили, реагируют другим образом. Но опять же, ну, то, что по-английски называется pattern of results, как бы модель результатов, не знаю, как по-русски сказать, она совершенно одинаковая. Не то, что человек, который в школу ходил, будет реагировать одним образом, а человек, который не ходил, совсем другим. А у них одна и та же тенденция, но она выражена по-разному. Okay, then maybe I'll ask a, ask a question very briefly. Uh -huh. uh, if, if nobody else, ah, Misha, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's in Russian or in English? It doesn't matter. It's not a real question. It's more like an interview kind of question. I was just wondering about your personal stance on some issues that you kind of, you know, we're not very commit, committal about. First, uh, you said that graded judgment do not uh, mean graded gradient grammar. And I was wondering about your personal. So the question is whether I believe in that gra grammatical gradient. constraints are gradient. Uh, um, I, tend to, I tend to think that they should not be. And if they're gradient, that means maybe we haven't done all the work. And um, that's where I would uh, call back to this uh, picture of super additive effect. So if we, we don't get um, like contrast, yes, no, that means something else is at play. We just need to work a little harder. I know it's a personal opinion and a lot of people actually talk about scales and hierarchies. Um, I have worked on a bunch of things like, for example, person case constraint, where it's just a very complex phenomenon. You unpack it into smaller grammatical atoms and each of them is great. And so just, uh, you know, as a matter of personal taste and opinion, I like things to be broken into smaller units and they tend to be yes, no, or discrete. Okay. Um, there was yeah. a question okay, from Vadim Dichko. No, but there's still there's still Igul's question oh. about. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry that uh, actually she wanted me to read. Like, what about Basque about uh, in this kind of study? Uh, and I guess it's about like uh, means the oh, study. You're of, muted. Of the kind. Am I? No, uh, Igul is muted. So. Yes, well, 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 actually, in the chat, and it was voiced by Dmitry. Well, I agree that maybe uh, one possible candidate could be Basque for an ergative language, uh, uh -huh. which is uh, not so well. Well, actually, I don't know much about Basque. So, yeah, Peter said there is no significant nominative of acoustic component in Basque in contrast to Georgian and Kinti. There was a study of uh, Basque. Um, ergative clauses, or sorry, um, relative clauses. Uh, they found in the reading times, they found the exact same effect with, I found in um, Avar, and we found in Georgian ergatives. Uh, but then, uh, and I also did the same for, for Tongan and Nguyen, two Polynesian languages with a completely different word order. Uh, and then there was a study uh, which was run in Manolo Carrera's lab in um, 
San Sebastian, where they ran an ERP study like the one I showed you on Georgian. Uh, and they actually interpret it quite differently. They say that there is a different effect, not um, anterior negativity, but so-called P600. Uh, in order to interpret ERPs, you need to know when the effect happens and which part of the skull it happens on. So anterior negativity is called anterior because it happens over here. When you look at their effect, which they call P600, uh, it's actually, again, anterior negativity because it's not posterior as P6 or central as P600 is. So this is the disagreement in terms of how you interpret the ERPs. I've actually written about that in the Handbook of Ergativity where I gave a detailed analysis of how their results do not match up what we know about anterior negativity across other languages. So I um, stand by my interpretation. And in fact, they then ran another study with Basque Spanish bilinguals, and they found that these people had the same neural signature as English speakers or Spanish speakers. So in terms of uh, fancy gadgets and ergative languages, people have looked at uh, Basque and Georgian, the result is more or less the same. Hindi does not have relative clauses. Hindi has core relatives. And that's something that um, I've been planning. We wanted to do Hindi correlatives and Georgian correlatives with ARPs. Um, I have all the stimuli, but then COVID happened. So hopefully in a year or so, we'll be able to run something like that. But you know, if this, the predictions I showed you are correct, we're gonna get land anterior negativity for core relatives in Hindi and in Georgian. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Vadim, if your question is really quick. Ну, у меня на самом деле действительно вопрос простой. Вот скажите, пожалуйста, научилась ли что-то лингвистика делать с теми случаями, когда мы не можем по объективным причинам запустить всю машинерию экспериментального синтаксиса, когда у нас есть вот два информанта по абсолютно объективным причинам? Mm -hmm. И можем ли мы получать какие-то достоверные данные по таким языкам? И, и если Вы знаете, нас, как? Ну, я, наверное, оптимистка, но мне кажется, что да. Потому что а, вот все эти а, сложные эксперименты, в которых там сложная аппаратура или сложная статистика, их хорошо делать, когда у тебя там можно собрать миллион американских студентов или там миллион русских студентов. Но когда у тебя есть две бабушки, которые сидят там, пьют с тобой чай, то просто можно повторить все то же самое, но провести с ними два месяца, приходить и тупо спрашивать одно и то же по много раз. И на самом деле это по, по как бы дизайну и по интенциям не, не очень отличается от экспериментальной работы. Просто это очень часто надо спрашивать. Но вот на своем опыте я могу сказать, я очень много занималась цесским языком, и мой, мой самый лучший информант – это жена моего главного информанта. То есть я сначала спрашиваю своего информанта, потом я звоню по скайпу или по WhatsApp, там это, ну, лучше по скайпу этой самой жене, она еле-еле говорит на всех языках, кроме цесского. Вот, это, в общем, значит, поэтому сначала я работаю со своим главным информантом, который там знает много языков. Мы говорим по-русски, по-цесски и по-аварски. И как-то я из него выбиваю какие-то очень сложные структуры. Потом я звоню ей, и она так, сударь, там, я уже привыкла, как она там бровью двинет, я понимаю, нравится ей это или не нравится. То есть это просто очень длинный процесс, но мне кажется, если его делать экологически честно и аккуратно, и тратить много времени, то результаты будут ничуть не хуже, чем то, что мы получаем в экспериментальных работах. Была такая работа а, с Прауза и Алнейдой, они взяли что-то такое... Около тысячи примеров из журнала Linguistic Inquiry прогнали их через огромное количество невинных информантов, там, студентов университета в Калифорнии. И результаты оказались очень похожими, что означает, что, в общем, мы свою работу делаем не очень плохо. Вот. Может быть, это мой излишний оптимизм. Но если ты приезжаешь в какую-нибудь там деревню или на какой-то остров на один день, на бегу спрашиваешь там трех туземцев и уезжаешь, то это, конечно, очень подозрительно. Мне кажется, что вот такое повторение экспериментальной работы в поле – это просто длительная, тупая работа с а, одними и тем же информантами. Там, меняем лексические единицы, приходим там один раз вечером, один раз утром, спрашиваем, когда бабушка поела, когда бабушка уже спать ложится и так далее. Вот, а, 
Я уверена, что половина народа здесь скажет, что фу, это все очень плохо, это не, не научно. Но мне кажется, надо добывать данные так, как мы можем просто делать это честно. Спасибо большое. Это очень, э, звучит немножко поддерживающе. Тут, э, ну, нам, видимо, пора постепенно закругляться. Тут спрашивают э, о том, чтобы выложить презентацию. Но я думаю, что это Хорошо. Можно, да, да. Я пошлю, э, тогда я пошлю э, нашему боссу э, Диме презентацию, и я пошлю вот эту статью «Hood and Everett», которую я цитировала. И очень буду благодарна всем, кто на нее посмотрит и какие-то свои мнения про этот код случай выскажет.